government is an interlocking network of official functionaries, spies, mercenaries, ex-generals, profiteers, and super patriots who for a variety of motives operate outside the legitimate institutions of government. Presidents have turned to them when they can't win the support of the Congress or the people, creating that unsupervised power so feared by the framers of our Constitution. Just imagine that William Casey's dream came true. Suppose the enterprise grew into a super-secret, self-financing, self-perpetuating organization. Suppose they decided on their own to assassinate Gorbachev or the leader of white South Africa. Could a president control them? And what if he became the enterprise's public enemy number one? Who would know? Who would say no? The secret government will continue in a few moments. With the history of our secret government. two was over. Europe lay devastated. The United States emerged as the most powerful nation on earth. But from the rubble rose a strange new world, a peace that was not peace and a war that was not war. We saw it emerging when the Soviets occupied Eastern Europe. The Cold War had begun. An iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. The Russians had been our ally against the Nazis, an expedient alliance for the sake of war. Now they were our enemy. To fight them, we turned to some of the very men who had inflicted on humanity the horrors of Hitler's madness. We hired Nazis as American spies. We struck a secret bargain with the devil. One that I know real well is Klaus Barbie. He was wanted by the French as their number one war criminal. And somehow we employed a man like that as a very secretive informant. Earhart Dabringhaus was employed in the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps and assigned to work with Nazi informants spying on the Russians. One of them was Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, who had tortured and murdered thousands of Jews and resistance fighters. The Americans did not turn Barbie over to the French when they finished with him. They helped him escape to Bolivia. Other top Nazis were smuggled into the United States to cooperate in the war against the new enemy. So began the morality of the Cold War. Anything goes. The struggle required a mentality of permanent war, a perpetual state of emergency. And it meant a vast new apparatus of power that radically transformed our government. Its foundations were laid when President Truman signed into law the National Security Act of 1947. Now that National Security of Act, Act of 1947 changed dramatically the direction of this great nation. It established the framework for a national security state. Admiral Jean LaRocque rose through the ranks from Ensign to become a strategic planner for the Pentagon and now headed the Center for Defense Information, a public interest group. The National Security Act of 47 gave us the National Security Council. Never have we had a National Security Council so concerned about the nation's security that we were always looking for threats and looking how to orchestrate our society to oppose those threats. National security was invented almost in 1947. And now it has become the prime mover of everything we do is measured against something we invented in 1947. The National Security Act also gave us the Central Intelligence Agency. This is the house the Cold War built, the CIA, the core of the new secret government. Its chief legitimate duty was to gather foreign intelligence for America's new role as a world power. Soon it was taking on covert operations, abroad and at home. As its mission expanded, the CIA recruited adventuresome young men like Notre Dame's All-American, Ralph McGeehy. I look back to the individual that I was when I joined the agency. I was a dedicated Cold Warrior who felt the agencies out there fighting for liberty, justice, democracy, and religion around the world. And I believed wholeheartedly in this. Um, I, I just felt proud every day that I went to work because I was out at the vanguard of the battle against the international uh, evil empire, international communist, the evil empire. Iran, 1953, the
the CIA mounted its first major covert operation to overthrow a foreign government. The target was the Prime Minister of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh. He held power legitimately through his country's parliamentary process, and he was popular. Washington had once looked to him as the man to prevent a communist takeover. But that was before Mossadegh decided that the Iranian state, not British companies, ought to own and control the oil within Iran's own borders. When he nationalized the British-run oil fields, Washington saw red. The Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, and his brother Allen, director of the CIA, decided with Eisenhower's approval to overthrow Mossadegh and reinstate the Shah of Iran. The mobs paid by the CIA and the police and soldiers bribed by the CIA drove Mossadegh from office. Crown Prince Abdullah greets the Shah as he lands at Baghdad airport after a seven-hour flight from Rome. The King of Kings was back in control and more pliable than Mossadegh. American oil companies took over almost half of Iran's production. U.S. arms merchants moved in with $18 billion of weapon sales over the next 20 years. But there were losers. Nearly everybody in Iran of any importance has had a brother or a mother or a sister or a son or a father tortured, jailed, uh, uh, deprived of property without due process. I mean, an absolutely buccaneering dictatorship in our name that we supported. SAVAK was created by the CIA. SAVAK, the Shah's secret police, tortured and murdered thousands of his opponents. General Richard Secord and Albert Hakim, whom we met earlier, were among those who helped supply the Shah's insatiable appetite for the technology of control. But the weapons and flattery heaped by America on the Shah blinded us to the growing opposition of his own people. They rose up in 1979 against him. Death to the Shah, they shouted. Death to the American Satan. Khomeini is a direct consequence, and the hostage crisis is a direct consequence, and the resurgence of the Shia is a direct consequence of the CIA's overthrow of Mossadegh in 1953. Guatemala, 1954. Flushed with success, America's secret government decided another troublesome leader must go. This time it was Jacobo Arbenz, the democratically elected president of Guatemala. Philip Redinger was recruited from the Marines to join the CIA team. It was explained to me that it was very important for the security of the United States that um, we were going to prevent a Soviet beachhead in this hemisphere, which we have heard about very recently, of course, and that uh, the Guatemalan government was communist, and, uh, and we had to do something about it. President Arbenz had admired Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and his government voted often with the American position at the United Nations. But in trying to bring a new deal to Guatemala, Arbenz committed two sins in the eyes of the Eisenhower administration. First, when he opened the system to all political parties, he recognized the communists, too. Well, of course, there was no, no even a hint of communism in his government. He had no communists in his cabinet. He did permit the existence of a very small communist party. Arbenz also embarked on a massive land reform program. Less than 3% of the landowners held more than 70% of the land. So Arbenz nationalized more than one and a half million acres, including land owned by his own family, and turned it over to peasants. Much of that land belonged to the United Fruit Company, the giant American firm that was intent on keeping Guatemala quite literally a banana republic. United Fruit appealed to its close friends in Washington, including the Dulles brothers, who said that Arbenz was openly playing the communist game. He had to go. This it was a sudden death for him. I mean, there was no chance of him winning this, this fight because of the fact that he had done this to the United Fruit Company, plus the fact that he was over, overthrowing the hegemony or hegemony of the United States over this area. And this was dangerous. It could not be tolerated. We couldn't tolerate this. From Honduras, the same country that today is the Contra staging base, the CIA launched a small band of mercenaries against Guatemala. They were easily turned back. So with its own planes and pilots, the CIA then bombed the capital. Arbenz fled and was immediately replaced by an American puppet, Colonel Carlos Castillo Armas. He overturned all of the reformist activity of President Arbenz. He, 
He uh, gave the land back to the United Fruit Company that had been confiscated. He took uh, land from the peasants and gave it back to the landowners. The CIA had called its covert action against Guatemala Operation Success. Military dictators ruled the country for the next 30 years. The United States provided them with weapons and trained their officers. The communists we saved them from would have been hard pressed to do it better. Peasants were slaughtered. Political opponents were tortured. Suspected insurgents were shot, stabbed, burned alive, or strangled. There were so many deaths at one point that coroners complained they couldn't keep up with the workload. Operation success. What we did has caused a succession of repressive military dictatorships in that country and has been responsible for the death of over 100,000 of their citizens. Success breeds success, sometimes with dreary repetition. Mario Sandoval Alarcon began his career in the CIA's adventure in Guatemala. Today, he's known as a godfather of the death squads. In 1981, after lobbying Ronald Reagan's advisors for military aid to Guatemala, Sandoval Alarcon danced at the inaugural ball. Richard Bissell, another veteran of the Guatemalan coup, went on to become the CIA's chief of covert operations. I looked him up several years ago for a CBS documentary. Cuba, 1961. Seven years after Operation Success in Guatemala, Bissell was planning another CIA covert operation. The assault has begun on the dictatorship of Fidel Castro. On April 17, 1961, Cuban exiles trained by the CIA at a base in friendly Guatemala landed on the southern coast of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs. The U.S. had promised air support, but President Kennedy canceled it. The invaders, left defenseless, surrendered. Seven months after the disastrous invasion, Kennedy delivered a major foreign policy address. We cannot, as a free nation, compete with our adversaries in tactics of terror, assassination, false promises, counterfeit mobs, and crises. The president was not telling the truth. Even as he spoke, his administration was planning a new covert war on Cuba. It would include some of the dirty tricks the president said we were above. The secret government was prepared for anything. At one time, the CIA organized a small department known as Executive Action, which was a permanent assassination capability. Well, it wasn't just an assassination capability. It was a capability to discredit or get rid of people. But it, did, it could have included assassination. And it did. There were at least eight documented attempts to kill Castro. He says there were two dozen. And there was even one effort to put LSD in his cigars. To help us get rid of the Cuban leader, our secret government turned to the Mafia, just as we once made use of Nazis. The gangsters included the Las Vegas mafioso John Rosselli, the Don of Chicago, Sam Giancana, and the boss of Tampa, Santo Traficante. If I read you correctly, you're saying it's the involvement with the Mafia that disturbed you and, and, and not the need or decision to assassinate a foreign leader. Correct. It's a chilling thought, made more chilling by the assassination of John Kennedy. The accusations linger. In some minds, the suspicions persist of a dark, unsolved conspiracy behind his murder. You can dismiss them, as many of us do. But knowing now what our secret government planned for Castro, the possibility remains. Once we decide that anything goes, anything can come home to haunt us. Vietnam. 1968, American soldiers are fighting and dying in the jungles of Southeast Asia. But the Vietnam War didn't start this way. It started secretly, off the books, like so many of these ventures that have ended disastrously. The CIA got there early, soon after the Vietnamese won their independence from the French in 1954. Eisenhower warned that the nations of Southeast Asia would fall like dominoes if the communists led by Ho Chi Minh took over all Vietnam. To hold the line, we installed in Saigon a puppet regime under No Dinh Jim. 
American trained commandos were used to sabotage bus and rail lines and contaminate North Vietnam's oil supply. President Kennedy sent the Green Berets to Vietnam and turned to full-scale counterinsurgency. He had once said Vietnam was the ultimate test of our will to stem the tide of world communism. By the time of his death, there were 15,000 Americans there. They were called advisors. The secret war was leading only to deeper involvement and more deception. It is my duty to the American people to report that renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. This president was not telling the truth either. The action in the Gulf of Tonkin was not unprovoked. South Vietnam had been conducting secret raids in the area against the North, and the American destroyer, ordered into the battle zone, had advance warning it could be attacked. But Johnson seized the incident to stampede Congress into passing the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. He then used it as a blank check for the massive buildup of American forces. April 1965. Two battalions of Marines land in South Vietnam, the first of more than two and a half million Americans to fight there with no congressional declaration of war. The dirty little war that began in secret is reaching full roar. Free fire zones, defoliation, the massacre at My Lai, Napalm, and the CIA's Operation Phoenix to round up torture and kill suspected Viet Cong. We were murdering these people, incinerating them. Ralph McGee was there for the CIA and helped set up South Vietnam's secret police. My efforts had resulted in the deaths of many people. And I, I just, for me, it was a period when I, I guess I was, I consider myself nearly insane. I just couldn't reconcile what I had been and what I was at the time becoming. Many of the secret warriors in Southeast Asia had no such doubts or regrets. Some of the team that later joined the Iran-Contra enterprise helped to run the secret war in Laos. Coming in from an altitude of about 2,000 feet. As General Richard Secord later put it, Laos belonged to the CIA. Looking back, it's stunning how easily the Cold War enticed us into surrendering popular control of government to the national security state. We've never come closer to bestowing absolute authority on the president. Setting up White House groups that secretly decide to fight dirty little wars is a direct assumption of the war powers expressly forbidden by the Constitution. Not since December 1941 has Congress declared war. Since then, we've had a police action in Korea, advisors in Vietnam, covert operations in Central America, peacekeeping in Lebanon, and low-intensity conflicts going on right now from Angola to Cambodia. We've turned the war powers of the United States over to where we're never really sure who, or what they're doing, or what it costs, or who is paying for it. The one thing we are sure of is that this largely secret global war carried on with less and less accountability to democratic institutions has become a way of life. And now we're faced with a question brand new in our history. Can we have the permanent warfare state and democracy too? A shellfish toxin. In 1975, as the war in Vietnam came to an end, Congress no took its first public look at the secret government. Senator Frank Church chaired the Select Committee to Study Government Operations. The hearings opened the books on a string of lethal activities, from the use of electric pistols and poison pellets to mafia connections and drug experiments. And they gave us a detailed account of assassination plots against foreign leaders and the overthrowing of sovereign governments. We learned, for example, how the Nixon administration had waged a covert war against the government of Chile's president, Salvador Allende who was ultimately overthrown by a military coup and assassinated. Like Caesar peering into the colonies from distant Rome, Nixon said the choice of government by the Chileans was unacceptable to the President of the United States. The attitude in the White House seemed to be, 
if in the wake of Vietnam I can no longer send in, send in the Marines, then I will send in the CIA. This remains for me the heart of the matter. The men who wrote our Constitution, our basic book of rules, were concerned that power be held accountable. No party of government and no person in government, not even the president, was to pick or choose among the laws to be obeyed. But how does one branch of government blow the whistle on another? Or how do the people cry foul when their liberties are imperiled if public officials can break the rules, lie to us about it, and then wave the wand of national security to silence us? Can it happen again? You bet it can. The apparatus of secret power remains intact in a huge White House staff operating in the sanctuary of presidential privilege. George Bush has already told the National Security Council to take more responsibility for foreign policy, which can, of course, be exercised beyond public scrutiny. And a lot of people in Washington are calling for more secrecy, not less, including more covert action. This is a system easily corrupted as the public grows indifferent again and the press is seduced or distracted. So one day, sadly, we're likely to discover once again that while freedom does have enemies in the world, it can also be undermined here at home, in the dark, by those posing as its friends. I'm Bill Moyers. Good night. I've been waiting for something to happen